Hello, folks. Uh, got some really positive feedback from the first 10 lectures, so I wanted to do an 11th lecture around ideas that haven't worked. And I say that with a caveat because, of course, there's always new innovations that can come along and change paradigms, but uh, Fusion has been around for about 70 years, so we've tried a lot of things that haven't worked. And one of the things that I would fault this field for doing, uh, at least on the private side, is repeating bad ideas. Um, so I, I wanted to do this lecture, and uh, Stephen Dean, who runs the Fusion Power Associates in Washington, D.C., and has been involved in Fusion since the 1950s, uh, put it to me in a very interesting way. He said, there will always be scientists who will excuse new ideas completely out of hand, and there will always be scientists who say, no, 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 let's take a look at this idea uh, and consider it. So uh, that's something that I'd like to try to practice is uh, an open mind with an understanding of the constraints around uh, plasma physics. So uh, there are two general categories of bad ideas in fusion. The first category are those that are completely baseless, uh, that have no basis on in physical reality. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to set those aside for now. The, the second category are things that have some basis where an observation is made in, it may say, another branch of particle physics like mass spectroscopy or power dynamics or, or superconductivity and then brought over and scaled up to fusion conditions. Um, that, that's a common theme amongst bad ideas. And what happens is you'll see someone who will read a paper that'll have some observation of plasma and they'll say, okay, well, we're going to take that effect and we're going to scale it up to reactor conditions. And generally what happens is when you try to do that, um, you have competing effects that drown out the effect you're trying to amplify, essentially, or the effect you're trying to amplify only works in a limited limited operating window and when you try to go to reactor level conditions you get uh, new conditions and new new situations that where it does not work because it's overrode by some other competing effects i mean in almost all these reactor approaches there are seven ten twelve different competing physical effects that are happening simultaneously and you're trying to get more of what you want and less of what you don't want in almost all cases. And a lot of times an effect will, will be nice and it may work on a small scale, uh, but then it doesn't, doesn't hold water when you try to scale up to the, the, the density, temperature, and time trapping that you need to get to net power. So I want to focus on one category, which is beam beam and beam target systems. I'm going to talk about beam beam systems first, and then we'll go to beam target. So the earliest work around beam beam systems was a paper, early work by Marshall Rosenbluth, who showed that they wouldn't work. Uh, and what he did was he just did some math equations. But what he did was he, he imagined a scenario where you have two beams of ions coming together. Now, the immediate issue is that the ions Coulomb repulsion will cause them to fly apart. And in general, as a general rule, nature does not want a beam of ions to move from point A to point B in a coherent manner. The beam wants to rip itself apart. Uh, and even if you dope it to make it quasi-neutral, you, you still have that general spreading. Beam spreading is a very common thing. So Marshall Rosenbluth modeled beam spreading, and he, he said, okay, how much energy does it take to keep this beam coherent as it moves through space? And then if we had two beams colliding, what is the expected amount of energy that will be generated by a fusion interaction when they collide together? Uh, and I'm going to compare those two numbers, and I'm going to see that holding the beam coherent is about 100 to 1 against. And this was one of the earliest um, sort of back-of-the-envelope calculations. He, we do this in lectures and things, and it won't work. So he works out that on a calculation and he shows that beam beam systems won't work. Now, in fairness to some people, you know, some people would stop at that point and say, okay, we've got some theory that shows that, hey, this is not going to work by a factor of, of an order of magnitude or, or two orders of magnitude. 
you know, th- this is this is not a good idea. Let's avoid this path. Other folks are going to say, no, 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 it's just a bunch of math. I want to actually test it and I want to build a hard system and, and try something. So one person that, that did try to do that was a fellow named Bogdan Maglich. And he's probably the most famous example of a fusioneer uh, who adamantly believes in what they want to do so fervently um, that they are willing to sacrifice years and years of time and their professional life and, and other things in order to pursue it. So Bogdan Maglich was born in the 1930s uh, in Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, I believe. Uh, received his PhD, moved to the United States in the 50s, and became a professor at Princeton University. Uh, and he was a full professor when he came up with this idea for a MIGMA machine. His concept, the MIGMA, was essentially beams of recirculating particles that collide in the center of a figure eight configuration or a clover leaf configuration or some other configuration. When the collision occurs, he believed that he could get uh, fusion power from it. And he, he pitched that uh, idea to the Department of Energy. And well, at the time, it wasn't called the Department of Energy. It was uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, I think, and some military branches and he was able to raise a little bit of seed money to try his idea, but almost immediately the whole fusion community rejected his idea uh, outright um, because of the problems that I just listed. The beam beam systems just don't work. Um, you want to have bulk reactions in bulk plasma. You don't want to have small reactions in small amounts. Uh, the amount of energy you get out of that just just doesn't equate to the amount of energy it was required to keep those systems running, operating, and coherent. Um, but he refused to, to believe that. He did not listen, uh, and he became notorious for suing people. He would threaten to sue someone if they gave him a bad critique on a proposal or a paper. Um, one person in particular, George Miley, tells a story where he was on an Air Force review committee for the MIGMA uh, that was submitted by Maglich, Dr. Maglich, and uh, he rejected it, and then Maglich uh, s- threatened to sue him. And George Miley was really concerned about this until he found out later that um, just about everybody had been threatened to be sued uh, by Maglich. Um, but over the course of, I, I think his, I, and I the exact numbers are in an article that uh, I may have linked here, but over the course of, of about 30 years, his concept was rejected roughly 16 times by different review panels, proposal boards, um, grant submittals and other things. And he, regardless of that, he was able to prevail a little bit and gather some money either from private investors or other uh, friends and family or wherever else he could get money and built uh, about half a dozen different prototype MIGMA machines, MIGMA 1, MIGMA 2, MIGMA 3, MIGMA 4, MIGMA 5, um, over a period of years uh, in the 70s and and 80s, and even into the early 90s. Uh, But these approaches ultimately did not work, and beam systems did not work out for him. Uh, And his company, he, he formed a series of companies after he left academia, and his most recent company was dissolved uh, in the late nineties and he passed away in 2003 or, or thereabouts, uh, early two thousands. So, uh, Maglitch is an example of a fusioneer who adamantly and fervently believes in his approach and would not listen to cr- criticism or scientific criticism, even from his peers or anybody else. And also, uh, wasted a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of his m- own money, um, pursuing something that ultimately didn't work. And if he had seen uh, or, or believed the theoretical papers uh, done early on in the field, he would have been able to determine that uh, that kind of system's not going to work. Now, I want to jump back to the early 90s and talk about another beam, beam system uh, developed by a, f- a fellow named Alex Klein. Now, Alex Klein uh, was a graduate student in uh, well, he was at University of Austin, and then he moved to Columbia, and he had an idea for recirculating beams, and his concept derived from work done at the Weissman Institute in Israel. 
In Israel, at the Weizmann Institute, there's a, a famous professor who's now actually, he moved up to be the director of the institute, who studied mass spectron spectroscopy. Mass spec, for those who don't know, is a conventional commercial product that's used in diagnostics, that's used for a lot of different um, commercial and useful applications. But the Weizmann Institute had an academic lab whose goal was to do research around innovative mass spec uh, technologies and different ways that they can um, manipulate and try different mass spec beams. And one of their papers showed a natural ion beam bunching effect. Now, just to take a step back, the way, the way these systems work is beams go through uh, an electrostatic lens, uh, which is basically an electro electrostatic field. As they travel through, they will either disperse or refocus. And it's the effect is called Gabor lensing because it was discovered by someone named Gabor. Um, so if you have a mass spec beam, you have beams of particles that are moving through lensing effects where they disperse and then they are recondensed and then disperse and recondensed and dispersed and recondensed in sort of a, uh, a wave-like fashion. So in this paper, they uh, discovered, or they observed at least, that the ions were naturally bunching together under certain conditions in a mass spec beam. And Alex Klein got his hands on that paper and argued, hey, we could take this little effect, which is just an observation, I would call it even a plasma trick, if you want to call it that, and we're going to scale it up to fusion conditions. We're going to take this minor effect and we're going to try to drive it up to fusion conditions, which again fits with this broader theme that I'm talking about with sort of half formed or, or poorly formed ideas where you have some something that's based on something real and physical, but then you try to drive it up to fusion conditions and it doesn't work when you get up there. But Alex, Alex was determined to do this. So while he was a graduate student at Columbia, he proposed uh, this concept to a, a whole slew of investors. So he went out and he wrote letter after letter and solicitation after solicitation to hundreds of different uh, wealthy individuals, financial backers, and other institutions to try to win money for his uh, concept, this beam beam system that he was gonna uh, build. And ultimately he actually did win money uh, from one inventor in the Buffalo, New York area. There was a fellow named Great Batch uh, that was his last name. I don't. I don't remember his first name off the top of my head, but he was a, an older gentleman, probably in the eight, his eighties at that time. He had been in, in a part investor and inventor and patenter of the artificial pacemaker uh, that had made him independently wealthy in the greater Buffalo area. And now in his eighties, he was interested in pursuing uh, interesting ideas, and somehow came across Alex's uh, proposal for this beam Gabor lensing effect and thought it was interesting and invited him out to Buffalo to meet with Alex and discuss the concept while he was a graduate student at Columbia University. Greatbacks offered to pay for the work. When Alex returned to Columbia, Columbia, uh, the head of the department there, leaned on Alex very heavily to, to not do this because he said, you know, we can't have alternative concepts being pursued and also uh, the beam systems don't work you know we, we've been down this road with the beam beam systems they don't work uh but alex uh, didn't listen uh and he ultimately finished uh, at columbia and he got a phd from mit because part of his work um overlapped with mit so his actual degree is from mit uh working on um a, a tokamak project so uh, once finishing, he was in Boston and he was still trying to pursue his concept. Now, he's been down this road about nine years at this point. This is now in the early 2000s. And he got a whole doctorate in plasma physics specifically so that he would have the credibility to follow this fusion approach. And he's he's almost done and he's almost given up with his uh efforts to try to win funding when he gets a call from a serial entrepreneur in the greater Boston area who connects him to some venture capitalists. And he is willing to go toe to toe with William Nevins, who is a senior staff scientist at, at Livermore, uh, who criticizes this stuff and basically argue, well, no, we could, we could get some money and we could take a look at this. 
So they end up getting money, uh, and it's something on the order of $3 million to do sort of a prototype. He forms a small company called FP Generation, and over a two-year period, using a staff of about six to 10 people, they built uh, two machines called Mix and Marble. So the first one uh, was a concept called uh, Mix, which had colli- uh, colliding beams, or excuse me, the first one was marble, which had a beam of material going back and forth in a single line. And he built an integrated, it's basically a metal cylinder with different magnetic lensing effects so that you have mirrors and electrostatic lensing at different points so that you get repeated oscillations of particles in one beam. Uh, and this this effect was patented and, and he developed this prototype. The cylinder was about the size of uh, about two feet long, roughly. There's pictures of it. And then the mix, that was the marble. And then the mix system was similar, but it had multiple beams going through at angles. So if you're keeping track, this looks an awful lot like uh, a Migma machine. I mean, Alex would, of course, argue it isn't. And of course, there were some differences, but it basically is the same basic physical mechanism where you have little bits of particles passing through the center of a, of a region, and you're trying to get them to collide in the hopes that they would collide. So, I mean, the system didn't work right away, and it, it may have, it had nothing to do with the, the central chamber at the, at the outset. His main problem was to get beams, beams to turn around, uh, they slow way down. So when you have a beam, a beam of particles coming to the end, and it's going to make that U-turn and go back down the center, it slows way, way, way down. And then when that happens... Um, the positive and positives, columbic repulsions basically cause the particles to fly apart. And so the machine lost a ton of uh, particles and mass through conduction losses at the ends. And, and oh, by the way, in the center, the particle beams don't fuse <laughs> the way that you hope them they could because of, of basic problems with beam beam systems. But uh, poor Alex, you know, he spent 11 years trying to do this. He had a company. Uh, and then ultimately, when they ran out of money, the company was closed. Everyone was let go. Uh, and then he uh, moved uh, to the Middle East, or excuse me, the Far East. Um, uh, I think Thailand or Cambodia, or one of those countries, Cambodia, excuse me. Uh, and he became a yoga instructor. So uh, interesting turn of events there. But it's another example of um, beam beam systems. So... That concept was handed off to a university professor named Raymond Sedgwick, who uh, at the University of Maryland. And uh, Raymond, who had worked in fusion development at MIT previously when he was assistant professor there, uh, had an interest in particle beam systems. And so he had mix and marble the prototypes basically in storage uh, in his lab at the university uh, for about a year and a half or two years. Uh, and then hired a PhD student named Andrew Chap to take a second look at this concept. And what Raymond, Raymond's approach was much more generalist, and he was just interested in, so we've got this modeling tools now. If we model this system, is, is there any way that this is possible to work? And this is just an open question. He was, wants to find out if somehow, in some way, beam beam systems could work. So Andrew Chap's uh, PhD was mostly focused on modeling the system, uh, and he learned all the uh, commensurate uh, skill sets and tools that came with that. Um, at the end of his con- uh, PhD, he made some really beautiful YouTube videos models of beams passing through essentially a honeycomb structure in a sphere, uh, where the beams would travel out and they would experience a field effect that would cause them to turn around and go back in through the center. And then he tried a whole variety of different uh, configurations, sizes, dimensions, powers, uh, basically trying to optimize the problem, pre-optimize the problem on the computer before he built anything in real life to see if we, we could reach uh, relevant densities that would be of interest to nuclear fusion. And at the conclusion of his thesis, he just said he didn't see how it was possible that uh, enough uh, beams or enough power or enough 
modeling would ever reach conditions relevant to fusion conditions. Uh, I mean, I think, I, I don't quote me on this, but his caps on densities might have been 10 to the 14th, 10, 10 to the 14th particles per cc in the center, which is just not dense enough to see appreciable fusion results in any any way, shape, or form. But I want to give props to Dr. Sedgwick and, and Dr. Chap for doing a, a thorough scientific study on a somewhat esoteric topic around fusion just to see if there was something down this beam-beam path at all. Now, I would consider that the case closed on beam-beam systems, but certainly there are other people who constantly propose uh, some fusion approach based off of this beam-beam system. I remember in the early 2000s, uh, there was a system called Crossfire Fusion, which was promoted by a French uh, gentleman who had his own website company, and he was uh, hawking ideas uh, called Crossfire Fusion, where these beams would come through and try to do fusion in the center. And again, it was just similar effects, si similar concept, and it has a similar pit pitfalls. But again, beam beam systems have fundamental plot problems. Um, there was a company called AGNI in uh, the Washington area, uh, started by two young youngish students who believed that they could get quantum mechanical effect that would cause a beam of material to better couple with a target or another set of material to create an increase in fusion reactions. And again, these beam beam systems kind of come up again and again through the decades. And if there isn't a mechanism inside the broader fusion community to uh, educate folks and just tell them, hey, we tried this, we've, we've tried this, we've tried this already. We've had uh, entrepreneurs try it. We've had scientists try it. We've had mathematicians and theoreticians try it. We've even had modeling try uh, try to make this system work. It's likely not to work, and there are much better fusion approaches out there that you could pursue. Uh, I wish that that was more widely prevalent in, in the fusion world because it would probably sift through and eliminate bad ideas from cropping up again. Um, but I think until we get fusion power and, and up until we get fusion power, as there's more and more interest and investment coming in, especially on the private side, we're likely to see these bad ideas come up again. Um, so I've talked about beam beam systems. I want to talk now exclusively about beam and target uh, fusion approaches. So a target is an object uh, and the beam of particles are coming in. They're going to collide with it. And in these these approaches, the the idea is always that the beam would come in and collide with the target in su such a way that you would see fusion power occur, fusion events occur. Now, um, they have similar problems as beam beam systems, and they have been tried pretty extensively. And the, one of the earliest examples of that was in the 1970s and 80s at Sandia National Laboratory. There was a fellow named uh Gerald Jonas, uh, I think I'm pronouncing that correct. Gerald Jonas, Dr. Gerald Jonas, who was enthusiastic about ICF driven ion beam systems. So, ion beam driven ICF, uh, where the, you have a beam of ions that are going to come in and they're going to collide with a target. And the thinking is that they would create a similar explosion and equal and opposite compression wave inward. Uh, that would cause fusion conditions to occur. If you want more details, see the ICF lecture. Uh, Jonas was enthusiastic, to say the least. He filed his own patent on an ICF-based, uh, ion beam ICF-based power plant scheme and was one of the group leaders uh, at the Sandia National Laboratory. Now, Sandia had plenty of money, and they had a small team. Uh, one of the people on that team was a fellow named Dr. Tom Melhorn, who is still with us today and is, was an assistant professor at the University of Michigan and now is an advisor to the University of Rochester LLE. So uh, if anybody who knows Tom can reach out to him and get some personal history on all this. But Jonas was enthusiastic, and he advocated for it, and Sandia put money into it. They built a machine called Nerva, and then they built a series of machines called uh, Electron Beam Fusion Reactor, EBPR, or PFR, excuse me, and then they built an Ion Beam Fusion Reactor, and then they built a second uh, version or an upgraded version of E uh, Electron Beam Fusion Reactor, 
And uh, they tried through the years, through uh, parts of the 70s and then into the part of the 80s, to try injecting a variety of different uh, beams of particles, different kinds of particles, into a target to try to get that same compression, explosion, compression, fusion mechanism that I've described in the ICF chapter. And it didn't work. The reason why was, again, earlier, nature doesn't like it when a beam of a single particle will go from point A to point B. That just doesn't naturally happen uh, normally because the Coulomb repulsions cause these charges to fly apart. So instead of a beam, you see just a general sp spray that eventually just becomes a cloud of ions. And if it's single charged ions, they're going to draw in current and they'll draw in the opposite charge. So if you have just the ions, for example, they will pull in electrons from the surrounding metal or from surrounding material wherever to sort of create quasi-neutrality. So a beam of particles going from point A to point B doesn't happen. And that basic problem uh, hounds uh, ion beam target systems uh, and creates, and then they have to add in all sorts of other effects, electric fields, magnetic fields, uh, increase the uh, momentum of the particles or make them do things that, that, you know, that are unconventional to try to overcome this natural tendency for the beam systems to fly apart. And uh, that kind of kills for ion beam ICF approach. Jonas uh, filed his patent and 17 years later, he lost the patent rights as they expired. And he you know, he has a lot of personal stories about this. He said he, you know, was very enthusiastic and kind of went through that valley of death where he realized that it wasn't going to work and had heartbreaks around it. Um, and then a funny story about him in the 80s, he was called to Washington, D.C. to be one of the lead scientists on the Reagan Star Wars program. Uh, and he has all these ridiculous stories about hobnobbing in Washington with the military political elites and having billions of dollars being thrown at him to try to make Star Wars work. And he personally knew the challenges around trying to make a large technical pro program like that work based on his experience in fusion. And so he would go out and talk to university teams, companies, and, and internally inside the Pentagon and have to try to explain to people who didn't understand physics why certain systems just don't work or why things don't work the way you want them to work. Uh, I, I think that's always the difference between people who view physics uh, from who are inside physics or inside an experimental science program, and then they have to build things and make them actually work versus people outside the program in management or politics or some other arena uh, like sales, for example, that are trying to sell a concept that have no experience with systems that that don't work. Uh, experimentalists can tell you that stuff is breaking all the time. I mean, that's just the that's just the lay of the land. And so sometimes ideas get oversold uh, because people don't have hands-on experience actually doing experiments and testing real hardware and systems. So that's sort of a a, a tale for that uh, example of that. So uh, beam targets don't really go away. Uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, there was a corporation called Fusion Power Corporation, uh, which was, I think, incorporated in New Mexico or Arizona by two brothers, uh, the Hirsch Hirschley brothers. One of them had a PhD in geology and was in uh, Hawaii. The other one was in Arizona. And they had a nice website where they were advocating for ion beam driven ICF uh, and they tried to promote the concept and the idea and they tried to raise money around funding that approach. It's the, th the hope that you could then take these ion beams uh, and put them in a grid structure around a target and initiate ICF Im implosions eventually. Um, you know, it would be great if that was possible because ion beam can be produced with so much less hardware and so much more efficiently than a laser beam system. And the argument always with these, these approaches is that the ion beam itself has mass. So if you do like a high Z or some kind of heavy element, 
And the argument is, well, this mass with this coupled with this momentum is going to create a much larger explosion slash impact or a much better shockwave compression on the target to improve uh, compression. But of course, uh, again, we've already talked about some of the problems with beam target systems. Uh, so I've talked about Fusion Power Corporation, about George Yornos's work at Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, you know, they spent about ten million a year every year for multiple years. They had a team of good scientists trying to make the ion beam system, ICF system, work. Ultimately, that that machine didn't work, but the hardware for that machine uh, eventually became the Z machine and the the world's largest pinch machine, uh, which is discussed in the pinch chapter. So I've talked about beam beam and beam target systems. Uh, so both of these concepts are, they have been with us for years. People have tried them, they have not worked. Uh, people have spent a lot of time and a lot of money, uh, both privately and public money, to try to make these work. They've looked at them from theoretical points of view. They've looked at them from computational modeling points of view. They've built benchtop experiments to try to build things, and they form companies around trying to build these things, and none of these things have panned out. So I, I'm, I'm kind of putting this out here as a public service to anyone who's interested in fusion right now. You know, uh, having, I see it all the time. I see folks that are really adamant about approach. They spend a number of years, some in some cases almost a decade or more, pursuing a specific approach only to find out that it wouldn't work. And then they come to me later in life and they say, I wish somebody had told me back at the beginning that my idea isn't new, that has it has already been tried. It had already been tried multiple times. Uh, I wish somebody had told me that. So that's part of the purpose of this lecture is to try to tell folks you know, where the pitfalls in fusion lie and uh, beam beam and beam target systems are certainly one example. Okay, thank you. I got one question from the internet about why these beam beam systems are different than mirror machines, because on the face of it, you could see that the similarities are pretty stark. Mirror machines are big bulks of plasma that bounce back and forth on a line. These beam systems are beams of particles that bounce back and forth on a line. Well, the biggest difference it's just the sheer number of particles in a mirror system. Uh, you know, a giant mirror machine like the MFTF that was the size of two school, a double deck of school bus, uh, would have uh, trillions of particles bouncing around inside them. And of course, in a, in a system like that, um, the, so for example, let's walk through the physics of that. Imagine a bunch of particles are injected into a mirror system using neutral beam injection, which is sort of a standard process for injecting particles. They're going to come in at a fixed energy. So monoenergetic, mono so the spread will look like you'll have a bunch of particles that will be really hot at one particular energy. Now as they start to bounce around, they start to spread out statistically. Some of them are colder, some of them are hotter, and that forms a bell curve. Now, if you leave the system in there and you're not doing anything else, like heating mechanisms, and there's a couple different ways to heat, uh, electron, electron cyclotron RF or ion cyclotron RF, which is essentially microwaving the, either the electrons or the ions. If you don't do that, if you don't do anything that, that feeds energy into the system, um, what's going to happen is the particles are going to start bleeding away energy as light. I mean, you can imagine a bright glowing ball of plasma in a mirror machine that's sort of shaped like a like a sausage and over time uh, more and more energy is going to leave as light and the particles are going to cool down and the spread is going to go from a starting point of a monoenergetic pillar to a bell curve to a like a bunch of particles that are super super cold on the left of the energy spread so uh, hopefully i'm showing a picture of that so that kind of makes sense to most people but that's the system in a mirror. And again, because mirrors have trillions upon trillions of particles where you have, um, you know, trillions of interactions that are occurring as the particles are bouncing off one another, um, statistically speaking, most of the interactions are not 
fusion interactions. They are positive, positive, Coulombic repulsion type interactions where two particles kind of ricochet off each other. Um, and statistically, only a small fraction of those are going to be the events that lead to fusion events that produce energy uh, that heat the plasma. So that's sort of what's, that's the situation in mirrors. If you can imagine all the material going around inside a giant sausage and it bleeding energy out as light, that's the mirror situation. Now, in contrast, the particle beam situation has a handful of particles, not trillions, but more on the, you know, tens of billions or maybe hundreds of millions of particles or even less. And because of the sheer um, reduction in the amount of plasma, statistically, you're just getting less um, fusion events to occur. So that's one of the other issues with beam beam systems is they're just fundamentally limited because they just don't have as much material and mass involved or in play to increase uh, the rate of fusion events. And I've seen uh, people propose uh, situations where they can get they can get the plasma in some special condition where they get higher ratios of fusion event compared to non-fusion event for every particle interaction. And so by some math, they can argue, hey, you know, we're going to use less material, but this material is going to be in a better situation where fusion events are more common and therefore uh, we'll get better performance out of our reactor. Uh, I've also seen people argue that there's some uh, trick they can do with chain reactions. Uh, you can get a fusion event to occur and it would reduce, it would create um, secondary electrons or secondary energy, which would then heat the plasma up. And so by extension, using this chaining of, of, of fusion events, you could somehow get um, a lot of power out of a small container or something. I don't believe that kind of thing. I really don't. Once a fusion event occurs, the helium is just so freaking hot that it's going to fly away at a very high speed and it's going to be lost forever. Uh, and furthermore, 80% of the energy from a fusion event leaves as neutrons. So if you wanted to sort of chain fusion events together, you have to do what everybody else has to do in fusion, get to a burning plasma, get to ignition conditions like they do on the National Ignition Facility at Livermore National Laboratory. So fusion chaining is, uh, is a thing, but it's also well understood within the fusion science community and the plasma physics community. We know what it requires to get there. So uh, I, I, I get very cringy when I hear claims uh, about fusion power in small amounts of plasma or fusion power in unique situations where um, fusion reactions are going to be chained together using some other effects. Uh, again, um, these things are limits on on the fundamental possibility of getting this to work there. And again, this is about getting out information about stuff that didn't work in the past so that we don't repeat history, right? If we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. And that is no more true than in the fusion power research space. Okay. Hope you're having a great day. Take care. Bye.